Okay, um, so hey everybody, we are gonna go ahead and get started now that it's 12. I'm sure there's a few more people who will pop in. Um, so thanks for joining uh, the Portland OWASP group for this lunch and learn, uh, especially after the weather Portland has had. Um, it's been kind of hectic, I know. Uh, I've been without power since Friday, so <laughs> I'm actually at a friend's house. Um, but yeah, uh, Wu is going to be talking to us and then we have a follow-up talk next week that kind of plays off of this. Um, he is a professor at Portland State University and I'll hand it over to him. All right. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, thank you for organizing this um, and thank you everyone for uh, being able to, to attend. It's been uh, trying times. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've done here at Portland State on uh, this CTF, uh, this cloud-based CTF called Thunder CTF. Uh, and the title of it is Learning Cloud Security on a Dime because it takes I think it costs about a dime to, to run this thing. Um, and this is work that's mostly that was mostly done by my student, Nicholas Springer. Um, and uh, you can get access to this CTF and play it and try it out uh, using uh, this URL. Um, and this is work supported by um, uh, NSF. Uh, and so just to motivate this, I don't think I have to do much motivation. There's a race to, to the cloud uh, going on right now. And you can see from you know even four years ago till projected out into, into next year that uh, people are spending a lot of money moving their operations to the cloud. And it's estimated to be upwards north of 300 plus billion dollars by 2022. Um, and uh, because of COVID, uh, this thing is accelerating uh, when they do a survey of uh, folks, uh, of businesses looking to uh, adopt the cloud. They have seen that people are more willing and able and uh, have are incentivized to do this. Uh, so another statistic. But when they also do a survey and ask, why aren't you doing it faster? Um, there's a top 10 list. So OWASP has their top 10. There's a top 10 list of why you wouldn't want to do this. Why is it a bad idea to go to the cloud? And some of these things are, you know, okay, you want to be in control of your own destiny. You want to be able to, you know, you want to actually physically be able to handle the stuff that your stuff, your, your things are running on. It costs too much. You're worried about vendor lock-in. You're worried about privacy issues in the cloud. Uh, but if you look at two of the top three reasons why people don't want to go into the cloud, um, the number one thing is security, and the number three thing is that we don't have any, we don't have enough people with experience uh, to get on the cloud. Um, so this is actually justified. The security uh, component is because if you think about it, you're taking one really complicated problem that enterprises are already having a hard time. Uh, dealing with, which is just traditional uh, security and traditional operating systems, your legacy sort of routers and firewall configuration, uh, your legacy user management and authentication. Uh, and then you add uh, a whole new layer of cloud-based things. Uh, the cloud has a different way of doing access control. It has a different way of managing the policies for that. In the cloud, you have to worry about account access keys and token management, and you have to be able to ro rotate those things. Uh, you have a new way of configuring security. Uh, a lot of the, the cloud providers have their own way of, of, of handling security. You have these things called federated identity providers, zero trust networks. You have new things you know, related to containers, serverless security, API security. You have way more stuff uh, in the cloud to secure. And that's on top of legacy deployments in the cloud that you also have to secure. Um, and so that that, lead, that gives us a, a, a reason to pause uh, when we wanna sort of um, uh, move our infrastructure to the cloud. Okay. Uh, and this leads to all sorts of problems. And this has been in the press. Um, you know, it's just like every week there's an open storage bucket somewhere on, on the internet that gets exposed and the, the content downloaded from. I think Parler is the latest. They had all of their stuff. Uh, uh, and I think that was an, yeah, that was an, that was an S3 bucket that was open. Um, uh, we have uh, misconfigured snapshots. So maybe you decided to do a machine snapshot in the cloud and you didn't uh, appropriately you know, lock the permissions down. And then there you have a machine image that anybody can access. Uh, and this is again, an example on AWS. 
Uh, you have misconfigured databases, whether it's uh, a legacy database in the cloud, like maybe um, like an RDS or a Cloud SQL, or if it's a, you know maybe a hosted Elasticsearch or maybe some other kind of database as a service thing that got exposed, uh, you could be uh, you could lose your information that way. Uh, you could have uh, the case where maybe you give a, an account uh, too many permissions, or maybe. Uh, for example, you haven't um, maybe in the in managing your employees, you've given some credential, extra credentials to a particular employee that's given them access to use uh, customer or user data when they should have only been able to access sort of like it's someone from the engineering team shouldn't have access to production user data, but maybe because you didn't have your privileges set correctly, they were able to. Uh, go and pivot to get information. So it's more like an insider threat um, in, in this case uh, with the with the Twitter. Uh, you have issues with exposed login credentials. So this is how Uber got uh, breached the, uh, uh, about three or four years ago. They had an AWS account uh, with a username and with a set of credentials. They got exposed, and then that's how the adversary uh, made it in. Um, again, cloud native things like, you know, API keys, account keys, OAuth keys, SSH keys, uh, those things can get exposed. So Starbucks a couple years ago uh, left their API, an API key uh, in their GitHub. Uh, Imperva um, had, had their data stolen because an, uh, an API key was exposed as well. Um, and uh, how bad can it get? Uh, well, there was a paper a couple years ago uh, I think this was at NDSS, where they basically scanned the GitHub uh, data stream. So all of the GitHub, the GitHub exposes an API. It gets you all of the, the basically the events that are are being sent through through uh, the GitHub API, and then they basically scanned uh, the event stream for all of the the juicy things <laughs> that you might find going across. And so basically, they're pulling like a couple thousand unique uh, uh, keys uh, daily, and then uh, it only took them on average 20 seconds before someone pushing a, a, a key, any one of these keys into their GitHub. It took them about 20 seconds to, to steal that. Um, okay, uh, we have the, uh, another thing that's sort of unique to the cloud and that's exposed metadata. And so this is uh, an example, of the Capital One breach from a couple of years ago where the expo exposed metadata service on uh, in, uh, basically a WAF, a, a, I guess this is OWASP, so a WAF. Everyone knows a WAF, but it's a security product that basically was vul this particular one was vulnerable to an SSRF attack, and then the SSRF allowed them to get the uh, metadata credentials of a uh, of the instance that was running it. We'll get we'll we'll come back to this because we do have a scenario that that simulates this uh, in our CTF. Uh, and then uh, this is the like the mother of all compromises. This is the one that I, I kind of like use in my classes because it's got just about like the kitchen sink in, in it. And I don't want to pick on Instagram, but like this particular one pur purportedly had everything that you would want to say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And so I'm not going to go through all of this, but the, the, it, was, it was pretty epic if you, if you clicked on this. I think Instagram denied that all of this stuff was, was possible. Uh, so there is some dispute um, uh, here. Okay, so criminals are racing to take advantage. Anytime there's any kind of chaos, which is basically what's happening now, anytime like you're forced to move all of your stuff into the cloud, there's gonna be chaos. And of course, criminals are gonna leverage this. Uh, and uh, there's just statistic, and I don't even know how true these statistics are, but like people are doing these studies and saying, oh, 44% uh, of the threats are cloud enabled now. Um, and so the question uh, on the defender side is, are we prepared? And so uh, there's th this organization called CyberSeq that us academics pay attention to because it's a measure of whether or not uh, we're doing our jobs. And it turns out in Oregon, uh, us cybersecurity educators are failing. We're like, uh, the, the, the supply of cybersecurity workers compared to the, the number of job openings uh, is, yeah, we're not doing our job over here. Um, and it's, and part of this is, is that we're not doing our job giving students the skills that, that are actually relevant uh, out there. And so as part to address this problem, um, 
we have this course, Web in Cloud Security, uh, that is trying to uh, modernize uh, what we're teaching our students so that when they, when they graduate and are getting hired, they actually have some skills that, uh, that companies can actually use immediately. And so this is our course. We have a bunch of code labs that are publicly uh, available. Uh, so, so anybody can go through this content if they, if they would like. So that's our, this is our uh, course. And so you can go to this site and you see all like, we, we start with the OWASP top 10, obviously. Uh, for the web part, we're like, oh, well, we might as well use uh, uh, OWASP for that. And, there's, and we use um, uh, Port Swigger's Web Security Academy uh, to, to teach a lot of those things. So application security is critical. Uh, but when it comes to cloud security, uh, you know, we, we want to teach what, what's actually important in the cloud. And so when we created these code labs and we're trying to teach students about cloud security, well, we have a code lab that does uh, uh, serverless, this serverless GOAT. So this is an OWASP uh, project. So we run that, uh, but that runs on AWS. Uh, it's like a, a Lambda with some other uh, things like storage buckets, Lambdas, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, we run Cloud GOAT. <laughs> which is also on AWS. Uh, these are really fun. Students love doing these things. And then there's the flaws exercises from Summit Route. So flaws and flaws too, but they're also AWS. Um, but we run a lot of Google Cloud here at Portland State. And so we're looking around and we're like, well, what can we run to, to teach students about uh, Google Cloud security? Uh, and it turns out we couldn't find anything. <laughs> And so because we couldn't find anything, we decided to try and build a cloud security CTF for Google Cloud Platform. And at Portland State, we play a lot of CTFs here and we have our favorite CTFs of all time. And we understand good design in CTFs when we, when we play it because we're like, wow, that felt really good going through that exercise. It didn't feel like I wasted my time. Uh, it, wasn't a bunch, it wasn't a bunch of repetitive stuff that didn't seem to be useful to me or, or anything like that. So I'm like, okay, so we're gonna take the best ideas that we have seen, including uh, in the aforementioned AWS uh, exercises, we're gonna borrow the, the best of what we have experienced and try and design a CTF that gets at that. And that's what, um, that's what Thunder CTF is. It's a CTF uh, targeting Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and so to give you the, just the highest level uh, picture of the design of Thunder CTF, uh, the first thing is that it's scenario based. And so what we want students to do is put their, you know, put, put themselves in the shoes of an adversary to really do the role playing, uh, because that's basically uh, adversarial thinking involves you understanding what the adversary is thinking. So this is simulating that. And so in order for students to really get into the heads of an adversary, we try and put them in a scenario that we have seen. Uh, we read a lot of these articles. And so if we've seen someone sort of do a certain like, you know, sort of hop, skip and jump over to the crown jewels of, of a cloud project, we kind of want to emulate the same thing. So that's one thing that, that is in the design of our CTF. Um, because this is a learning um, uh, exercise, it has to, the, the exercise has to be scaffolded and it has to support, and our ideal is to support what we call differentiated instruction in education. That means that the exercise is beneficial for the expert as well as for the beginner at the same time. This is hard to do. Right, because typically when you think of a CTF, you're thinking about, oh, it's only for the experts, right? Like, uh, or if you design course-based CTFs, which is what we have a lot of here at Portland State, you say, oh, it, it's meant just to get the beginners. So we wanna try and get both uh, if we can. Um, so it's scaffolded. Um, it's extensible, so everything changes. OWASP is changing their top 10 every couple of years. Uh, the cloud vulnerabilities change every month. Uh, so you never really know uh, what's gonna be relevant uh, in terms of uh, what you're gonna need students to go through. And so uh, the, the CTF itself is extensible so that we can add different levels uh, pretty easily and we can easily remove them as well. Uh, and we can do this based on what are the current vectors of exploitation. So if, if there ever is an OWASP uh, cloud top 10, we could just make sure that that CTF reflects the, the top 10 uh, appropriately. 
Uh, and then the last one is that it should be easily deployable. It should be pretty frictionless to get up and running. Uh, it should also be low cost, like so a dime is, is, is a good target uh, or free. Like if you get, we couldn't get everything to be free. It, it actually, we did use some things that, that go just a bit beyond the free tier, but it's, it's meant to be pretty free, uh, pretty much cheap. <laughs> free as in beer kind of thing is, is what we're looking for. Um, uh, the last thing is polymorphism. So we're running this in a class and we want students to actually do their own work. And so uh, the flags that are in the CTF are custom to a student so that you can deploy it in the classroom and then know that um, uh, it's, it's there, uh, that they have done that. Okay. So in terms of being scenario based, some of you are familiar with the MITRE attack framework. This is a sort of a threat informed enumeration of, of, of attacks or uh, of defense. So, so you use this framework, it's basically an enumeration of all the different attacks that, that, that they've come across. And then uh, this enables you to do threat informed defense. And so uh, one of the things with the MITRE attack framework is it gives you a really nice framework to see adversary behavior from beginning to end. Uh, and so we wanted to model our CTF uh, based on things that, that show up in this attack framework. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, I'm gonna go through this really quickly. Um, the, the, the idea of MITRE attack is that you have 12 general tactics. Uh, and then within each of these tactics, and these are things that the adversary uses to, to get what they want. And then within each of these tactics, there's different techniques that are instantiations of that particular tactic. And then every attacker's got a playbook and that's a playbook in green that you can see that are, these are the ways that the, the attacker is gonna go from, for example, initial access all the way through to data exfiltration. And so this is a way of saying, hey, I have a particular APT crew. This is their path through this matrix. So I can actually simulate this in a scenario and then be like, hey, you could be, what is it, fancy bear, or you could be whoever, whoever the, the, the latest bear is, you could pretend to be that crew uh, doing the kinds of things that that, that uh, crew is doing. Um, and so there's a MITRE attack framework for, the, for Google Cloud. Uh, it's only like a year old. It's not very fleshed out. Um, they haven't enumerated very many attacks on Google Cloud, but it's coming. Uh, and so this is the MITRE attack framework for, for GCP. And you know it's, it doesn't have 12, it's got what, how many is that, nine? Um, but then each of these columns has things that have happened on Google Cloud uh, that have enabled attackers to compromise a, a Google Cloud account. Now, there's a similar one for AWS and a, another one for Azure. Uh, part of the reason why there are different ones for different vendors is that there are certain things that only apply to Azure, certain things that only apply to AWS and, and, and so on. Okay, so the idea of our CTF is that we're gonna take this MITRE attack framework and there's a bunch of TTPs here. And so uh, the ones that are in light red are the ones that we implement. And then the idea is to create scenarios where you would go uh, across and then do basically leverage these, these techniques into a playbook in order to get what you, uh, what you need. Okay, and so this is just a subset over provisioning, weak IAM policies, privilege escalation, getting your keys in the code, you know, compromising access tokens, using the metadata service, all of these things show up uh, in this framework. And so it's a matter of implementing them in our CTF and then building levels that require you to go through here in order to actually compromise the account or fully compromise the, the, the project and then capture the flag, which is the, the, the end goal of this, uh, this game. So we'll, I'll actually, so I'll, at the end of this, I'll do a demo of one of the levels just to give you an idea of what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, well, I'm gonna actually walk you through the last level. So this is, uh, this is the sixth level. Uh, we've implemented six levels in, in Thunder CTF. And so uh, the A6 container level is actually modeled after the Capital One breach itself. And so the, the basically the process is you, you start with a this actually the last three levels or the last three steps are the Capital One breach, but you know we want our we like these longer scenarios. So then we actually threw in a you know, sort of a, 
a, a little bit of a precursor to the to the actual thing. Um, so all of the levels start with a compromised account key. So it just assumes that maybe you've you know you know maybe over Git you pulled a key or maybe you you know hijacked a web app and then it, that 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 application is running on a server that you can get the key the the access key for. So it always starts with a, a compromised account key. Uh, and then this account key maybe has privileges to list the compute in instances on the project. So that's what you do there. And then as part of listing the compute instances on the project, maybe you see that a particular compute instance is running a container. And so you're like, oh, maybe that container is you know, publicly available or maybe, maybe the, the image hasn't been protected. So then you pull the image. Uh, and then you examine the image and you see that there's some kind of interface that's vulnerable to an SSRF attack. And then you perform the SSRF attack on the virtual machine to get the metadata. And then from the metadata service, now you have the credentials of the virtual machine itself. And then you use those to get the storage bucket. So that's the last scenario. And apologies if, if that spoils it for you when you, when you uh, want to play the level. And so this is a, on the right, this is the gameplay. This is what the students are doing in order to actually solve the level. So, you know, well, this towards the, this is step four. So maybe you, you find that a container image is uh, this container image. And then you do a Docker history and you can sort of see some of the, the layers that are in this Docker container and you see it's a Python application. And so maybe you uh, pull the image and then you see the different routes that are in the application. And one of the routes is like some kind of weird admin proxy, <laughs> security by obscurity kind of thing. And then you're like, okay, well here, let me go to this admin proxy and it's giving me a URL. And that's the thing that gives you the SSRF. And then you, instead of using just a regular URL, you point it to the metadata service. And then by going to the metadata service, you would then get an access token. And this is the access token running on this proxy. And then onwards and upwards to a storage bucket, which is the last thing that uses the access token you just stole to get the secret. And then that gives you the flag. And then you screenshot the flag and you submit it as homework uh, in our class. And then you're done. Uh, so that's the idea of each of these uh, levels. Um, so the next thing is that the Thunder CTF is meant to be scaffolded. And so if you've played enough CTFs, you the, some of them aren't very kind and gentle. Uh, they actually like they defeat you. And like as a player, we don't we don't want students to feel defeated. That's sort of the opposite of education. Uh, we and so if you look at some of these CTFs, they're they're very evaluative, right? Like they're trying to rank a winner. They're trying to they're finding a winner. And so, in order to find a winner in a CTF, you pretty much have to tell everybody else they can't solve a particular level. That's not what we want here. Uh, we don't want esoteric levels that basically filter out ninety five percent of the people trying to solve them. Um, we want this idea. I mean, the ideal is to have it work for both. So, uh, so the way we do this is through an extensive hint system. And we build the hint system right into as, uh, how you de develop the level itself. Uh, and so th this, is, this is what allows us to uh, cater to both the expert and the beginner, because the expert can just ignore all the hints, right? Like, and then they can solve it straight up. And then uh, the beginner can use the hint system as like a code lab as step-by-step -step instructions. And that's what we've uh, done. Um, OK. So here's an example of our hint system. And you can see for A6 container, um, for a beginner who doesn't know anything about containers, doesn't know, anything about, doesn't know anything about access tokens, has difficulty in the cloud already, uh, they would want to go follow the hints. And then even though they're just mechanically doing these commands, and maybe it's not syncing in immediately, maybe the next time they play it, some of this stuff will sink in better. And we've seen this for students who have played this multiple times, maybe the second or third time around, they begin to really understand what is going on when they're exploiting a particular level. And that's what we've done. So you can play along by going directly through the hints uh, and exposing them one at a time. What I like to do is like, I'll play along and if I get stuck, uh, I'll advance the hints and retrace that, yes, these were the things that I was supposed to do. And then I'll get the next hint at, at that point in time. Because, you know, you, even if you know, if you, even if you know the punchline of most of these things, sometimes you just forget the mechanics. Uh, and then you'll need, you'll need the hint to 
or, or Stack Overflow or wherever you need to do to get unstuck uh, is the thing. OK, uh, the next thing is ex extensibility. So again, shifting threat model forces you to update this thing a lot. Uh, one of the things that uh, we found is that this metadata SSRF attack, that's, that's going to be a dead bug, bug class soon. Uh, Amazon, AWS has already shut it down. And they shut it down in a way that now that access token is bound to the IP address of the instance that it's running on. So basically pulling that thing forces you, like even if you get the access token, you have to do all of your exploitation on that same virtual machine, which is not very, it's not a happy place to be as an adversary to have to, to, to use it right there. Uh, Google has addressed this with this metadata flavor header and they disabled the legacy way of accessing the metadata service. So these things eventually will have to go away, like these levels, because it's like teaching people stack overflows, which, well, they shouldn't happen. They do happen still, but they shouldn't happen. Eventually, we'll stop teaching stack overflow because it won't be possible. But um, we have the Internet of Things to, to keep that alive and well. Um, uh, the other thing that we do is we have we've developed, a, well, actually, Nick. <laughs> Nick has developed a great framework, a developer framework for being able to create and deploy new levels. Uh, there's a lot of ugly low level code. So a lot of this stuff is built on deployment manager, Google Cloud's version of like uh, Terraform or uh, CloudFormation or some of the, you know, it, there's a lot of low level stuff there that you don't wanna actually have to program that. You wanna program at a higher level abstraction. And so uh, the Thunder CTF framework uh, has a bunch of helper functions to allow you to create levels uh, a little bit easier than writing raw YAML files. And I mean, you still have to write YAML files, but it's a little bit easier than, than, uh, uh, than it would otherwise. Um, and this allows us to not only build new CTF sequences, uh, but it also allows us to build new CTFs uh, themselves. And so next week, uh, my graduate student uh, is going to give a talk on what she built on top of Thunder CTF, which is a least privileged game to help students uh, practice securing, uh, uh, basically reducing the privileges of over-provisioned uh, accounts on a, on a cloud platform. OK, uh, so that's the UI for that. Um, this is just a high level figure of what this framework does. Um, so when you want to author a level, it's basically a single YAML file where um, you configure all the physical resources that your level needs. Uh, and then a, uh, a Python script that uh, uses the, some of the deployment manager features. Uh, and it uses it indirectly. We actually have a lot of um, uh, utility code that does some of the low level deployment. Uh, and so the framework itself encompasses uh, a lot of the common functionality that you would want to deploy on a level. So for example, like deploying a storage bucket with a particular file in it, like uh, that's, that's, that's something that you, you don't want to have to manually um, implement because it's almost all levels are going to have a storage bucket somewhere, uh, a storing stuff. So that's, that's the idea of the framework to try and make the development a little bit easier. And then, uh, the last thing that's part of the, uh, the creation of a level is just a, a hint content file, which is just like an HTML file that, that gives you the hints that, that show up in that, um, in that UI I showed you earlier. Okay. Uh, so again, this is all open source. This is all available. Uh, this is the GitHub for um, the project. And actually, so if you go to thunderctf.cloud, that's where all the code, the slides, uh, the instructions, that's how you play the CTF. You just go to the, the site uh, and then um, it's, it's all available for you to, to, to try out. Um, yeah, so there's, there's actually, th this is a, a, an automated uh, wiki uh, that basically gives you the, the development guide. OK. Uh, the last thing, it's, it's easily deployable. Um, it requires only a Google Cloud account to play. Um, and you probably need a coupon. Um, or at least, uh, I think you do need, like a yeah, you, you need some credits on there, I believe, to begin with. Um, but again, it consumes a minimal amount of resources. We tried to make things uh, serverless, as, as serverless as possible. So there are a couple of levels where it's actually deploying a virtual machine. Uh, but more often than not, we, we tend to go towards serverless resources just to make it cheap. Um, 
The, in terms of interacting with the CTF, deploying a level is as simple as just running the script, saying create, and then the level name. So uh, it's easy to, to launch and destroy. Um, and yeah, and then the, the flags are polymorphic, but this is custom to the, to the level itself. OK, so we've run this twice uh, a couple of years ago, like in fall 2019 in our in our um, our cloud cloud class. And then again in our web and cloud security um, uh, last winter. And uh, this was these were the results of the evaluation. Uh, most students haven't had a good time with it. They particularly like the hint system of getting unstuck whenever they did get stuck. And I think that's really important for a CTF to get people unstuck so they're you know, they're continually learning something rather than continually getting frustrated over something. And so that, that um, this was a good number for us to, to, to see. Okay, so I am going to then uh, give you a demo of one of the levels uh, in this CTF just to show you uh, the mechanics of, of doing it. Uh, I think it's helpful, uh, just in case I don't come back to the slides, it's helpful for, for me to show you a preview of everything that I'm going to do. Um, so that's what this next uh, slide is. So again, here we have the, uh, the MITRE attack framework. And so uh, this is a level, A2 Finance, where we start with a compromised account key, and then we pivot all the way over to get somebody's credit card number is the idea. So exfiltrating credit card data is, is one of the goals of this particular level. And so what we'll see is we'll start with an initial permission. So that's always the uh, initial access part of this. Uh, we'll go over and do some service discovery. We'll see what this uh, set of permissions has access to. And so we'll see that it has access to compute instances and storage. Uh, and then we're gonna go and access the storage buckets this credential has access to. So that's the next one, so collection. Uh, we'll see that uh, there's some Git, Git information in this storage bucket. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll pull it out of the repository and then we'll exfiltrate it to maybe our cloud shell or, or somewhere else remotely. Uh, and then we will basically uh, see that maybe there's an exposed SSH key in this repository. And then if we see the credential in the file, maybe because it's an SSH key, maybe we can look around for compute instances that that SSH key might work on. And so then we'll go and we'll discover uh, a compute uh, engine instance running, and then we'll use that SSH key to log in. And then from there, we can use the, um, if we have access to this particular machine, we can use that machine's privileges and it might have additional privileges on top of the initial permissions that we were given at the beginning of the level. So this is the idea of privilege escalation uh, using a valid account. Because we're now on this virtual machine, that virtual machine might have been given God mode on your cloud project, which is often the case. Like we're like, I'm going to give this virtual machine all the access to my cloud. And then if you get on that virtual machine, you have everything. Uh, and so in this case, uh, you escalate your privileges. And then uh, using that, uh, you then exfiltrate because you have access to the logging backend uh, from this virtual machine. Then you'll see that uh, the virtual the the logging. It turns out they haven't sanitized their error messages on their web app, and it turns out you can pull the credit card data. And this came this comes straight out of an OWASP slide where the uh, the the credit cards uh, are sent to the log the log file without being uh, sanitized appropriately. And that solves the level. And then you get the person's credit card number. OK. Uh, so with that, uh, I am going to spend the rest of the time going through A2 Finance. Uh, and so let me do that. Uh, actually, you know what? Before I do the demo, maybe I can take some questions, if there aren't any questions. Hey, Wu Ching. Uh, this is Michael Tucker. I had a question. Okay. Did you, uh, so you, did you do this through a grant through NSF or uh, how'd, you, how'd you go about uh, drumming that up? Uh, yeah, so this is funded. Uh, NSF has uh, funded my research group to basically build CTFs, uh, security CTFs. So yeah, this is part of that. And so we, we built several CTFs, uh, not just cloud CTFs. We do, we've done stuff on symbolic execution, malware reverse engineering, 
we basically look to build CTFs that we don't see CTFs uh, available for. And not only uh, available, but like those that are targeting instructional sort of content, whereas there's a lot of CTFs that are cloud CTFs, but they're, uh, again, they're more evaluative ones, yeah. So that's, awesome. that's, yeah, that's basically all I do now. I used to be more legitimate, but now I'm like, you know what? I, I got into computing because I like making, I like playing video games and I wanted to make video games and somewhere becoming legitimate, I lost that. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to gain that back. So basically we're building security games here um, at Portland State. <laughs> yeah, that gamification of cybersecurity is definitely the uh, the platform the learners like. So yeah, and we <laughs> love playing these things. So you figure if you play enough of these things, you feel like you you should probably give back a little bit. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do. Awesome. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Uh, so uh, let me. Here is my Google Cloud Shell. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Google Cloud, um, uh, almost everything can be done through Cloud Shell. It's similar, AWS actually just released their Cloud Shell, uh, but it's basically the similar to the AWS CLI, uh, but this is done on a hosted container that if you click this button up here, like if you log into the Google Cloud uh, console, through a web browser and you click the, the Cloud Shell icon, it just gives you uh, basically uh, the Google Cloud, the G Cloud SDK running in a container. And so that's what this is. And basically you launch the CTF from Google Cloud Shell and then most of the playing can be done just straight in Cloud Shell. So there's no installation. Uh, and that, that really, again, that makes it much easier. It's basically frictionless to actually get students to, to do the exercise. Um, so that's what I have here. And I've kept it up with this, uh, this ping command. <laughs> uh, Cloud Shell will time out if you're idle. So that's what I had there. Um, so uh, I'm going to first show you uh, Thunder CTF. Um, uh, there are instructions. If you go to Thunder CTF, there are, uh, there are instructions in terms of configuring your project. So typically you would like this, you would like to run this on a fresh project um, because it like, I mean, it, it's gonna deploy a bunch of stuff. It's gonna enable a bunch of stuff. More importantly, we have a defender path on Thunder CTF where uh, in order for you to do, so, so this is the offensive part. We actually built, and I, I don't have this talk available, but we have the, the attacker path. One of the things about the cloud is that you have to train the defender path. Like, like if you know you've been compromised, like how do you figure that out in the cloud? We talked about the lack of visibility. Uh, we're like, well, how do we teach students how to figure out that they've been compromised? And so in order to do that, we turn on all the log the, the audit logs on this project. And so this is why we would recommend uh, doing deploying this on a new project because as part of deployment, we actually turn on everything in terms of the logging backend. And then we have a set of exercises that allow students to go through the audit logs to basically see the adversary compromising each one of these parts of the, uh, of the project. So that's just an aside. Uh, but after you create a new project, you, you basically do some configuration. All of this stuff is done in Python. Uh, so this is uh, the next steps are basically to set up a Python environment to do the deployment from. Uh, you just clone the repository, you uh, set up your Python environment, and you activate it, and then it's go, go, go from there. And so the level that I'm going to walk you through to show you uh, just an example is A2 Finance. So if you click on any one, uh, any one of these levels, you'll, you'll get the instructions for, for working with it. So I'm going to click on A2 Finance. And so um, one of the things with A2 Finance, uh, well, you, you just activated this, so you don't need to run this. But uh, the, this particular level requires Git to be configured appropriately. So if you haven't configured Git on your cloud shell, this forces you to do so. Otherwise, the, 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 the level won't work. Uh, but then you're, you basically run a single command to launch the level. Uh, and then at the beginning of every level, so as part of launching the level, one of the things that is issued is that initial credential, like your initial account access. And that's always in this directory called start. 
And then it's this level, the level name dash access dot JSON. So the way OAuth tokens are given or passed around in, on Google Cloud is through a JSON file. It's got an OAuth token in it. And that's basically what this is. Uh, and so the, uh, in, uh, in Google Cloud, you just activate that service account. Um, so service accounts are the things that are attached to resources in Google Cloud. So that allows you to assign an identity to a particular or a role to a particular service. And then uh, if you have attached certain permissions to that role, uh, in order for you to assume that role, uh, you basically have to supply the, uh, the access token that, that's in this, this a2 access.json. We'll get to this a little bit later on, but uh, basically you can think of this command as taking on the role of whatever it is you compromised uh, is the idea. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, let me go back and, uh, and this is my cloud shell. Uh, let me make this bigger and, uh, let me, I hope everyone can read that. Uh, I think I can make the font bigger. Yep. It looks okay. Looks okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. So uh, I'm going to go into Thunder CTF. I've already deployed A2 Finance. It takes like a minute or two to, um, uh, to deploy. But uh, uh, at the beginning of every level, uh, if you cat start slash um, A2 finance.txt, this will give you. Uh, oh, all right. This will give you the goal of the level. So in this case, uh, you basically are given the instructions to use this credential to find the credit card number of Jason Clark. Uh, and this, this is randomly generated. So everyone is looking for a different person's credit card number and it's hidden somewhere in this, this Google Cloud project. Okay, so the first thing that you would do is follow the instructions of the level. And so you would do a G Cloud auth and then you would wanna activate the service account. And then, uh, a second. And then what you would want to do after that is you want to give it the key file. So dash dash key file. And then you would say um, start. No, actually, uh, yeah, start slash a2 access.json, I think is what it is. So then this activates the, the initial service account. Uh, and then uh, as part of this, you, you, you want to do some, probably some service discovery on this, on this uh, uh, access uh, that you've been granted. Uh, one of the things that we have given students is a script. Uh, and this script you can use anywhere, really. You don't, you don't have to use it on just Google Cloud. This is a script that if you give it an access token or if you give it a uh, uh, basically an OAuth token in a JSON file, this Python script will tell you all of the permissions it has on a particular project. And it does this using a brute force search over the 1000 plus permissions that Google Cloud has. And so we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna run this, uh, this test permission scripts. And we're just gonna say, hey, uh, dump out all of the permissions that this particular credential has access to. And that's what we'll do. Um, and so it knows it's a JSON credentials and then it will basically attempt to get access to all the thousand things that uh, it, it could potentially have access to. And you see that this token, uh, uh, this uh, access token has basically minimal uh, amounts of privileges, but you can do a nice, you know, in the scenario earlier, it can list and it can get stuff from instances uh, and then it can list storage buckets. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, this, the equivalent to AWS S3 uh, LS kind of things is on Google Cloud, it's uh, GSUtil LS. So uh, you can um, use uh, the GSUtil LS to say, oh, here are, the, uh, here are the buckets you have access to using this particular access token because you've assumed this identity. Uh, now you see you can list this bucket. And so um, uh, maybe I'll say, well, what's inside of that bucket? Let's see if tab co completion works here. It does not, okay. All right, I am gonna do the cut and paste from Google Cloud. And then from here, you can see that this bucket has, uh, you know, 
a dot git directory and a dot and a function directory. So maybe uh, this git uh, repository has something interesting in it. So then the student would, um, so maybe I'll make a directory foo and then I'll do a gsutil uh, cp dash r. Whoops, let me get this number. Ah. And then I'll uh, copy the contents of that directory uh, locally. Okay, and so now I'm here, I've got this bucket, co the bucket contents here, and then I see I have a Git directory. And so uh, one of the things that you would wanna do uh, to, to sort of investigate what's in this Git repository is uh, a Git log. And then you can see uh, the Git log has uh, this interesting uh, commit history, uh, deleted the accidental key upload. So then maybe I can uh, do a Git checkout of the previous commit, which is what I'll do next. Uh, so if I do a Git, Git checkout of the previous uh, commit uh, and then do an LS, then I can see that yes, there is an SSH key that uh, accidentally got uploaded uh, and so now this is an SSH key that will hope will presumably get you onto some VM instance. And so because in the previous listing of the permissions, we saw that we had compute uh, access. So then what I'm going to do is use the gcloud compute engine command uh, to basically go to the instances that I have and list them. So that's the next command. And then this will go, and obviously your deployment script has, has instantiated the virtual machine that has this. And you see there's a logging instance. So this is the name of the VM that's that's been instantiated and it's got this IP address. And so the next thing I wanna do is take a look at what is in the metadata of this particular VM instance. So every virtual machine has like meta information about the, the virtual machine that's uh, attached to it. And so uh, A2 logging instance, so I can uh, list that. Oh, wait. Uh, I need instances described. So now I'm going to describe that instance, and it's going to give me back all of this information about it. Um, it wants to ask about which zone it's in. Is it in? No. No. I need US West 1B. So it's on US West 1B. So this is all the information about that virtual machine. I hope it didn't scroll by too quickly. So this is at the beginning of it. And you can see everything about this machine. It's got a persistent disk of 10 gigs. Uh, one of the things that you can see when you, so when you set up these virtual machines with SS, SSH keys pro, uh, as part of the configuration of the VM, those SSH keys are stored in the metadata. Uh, that you can get access to by doing a describe instances. And so you can see here, there is a cloud user uh, that has this particular public key, SSH public key, uh, that is given access to this particular instance. And so that's the, um, uh, so, so we can try, we, we just exposed an SSH key. Uh, so let's try that SSH, that private key. Uh, let's try and use that uh, that SSH key to log into this particular instance. Uh, so the user is cloud user. Uh, the IP address is down here, um, is right here. So this is the external IP address of the machine. Um, one of the things that you have to do is you have to change mod the SSH key in order to run this. So with this SSH, SSH key, I'm gonna go log in as cloud user at that IP address. And then you can see now I'm on the logging instance, whereas before I didn't have access to this. Initially, I didn't have access to this. So this is again, elevating your privileges within the project. You're pivoting around and, and getting extra access. So there are some commands that, uh, you know, security folks will um, immediately execute once they, uh, once they get access to something like this. One of the commands is gcloud auth print identity token, prints the uh, uh, the identity token that's being used to run this thing. Another one that you are interested in for this particular level is the access token. 
And so uh, the way it works on Google Cloud is like, uh, so when you instantiate a virtual machine, uh, well, there's multiple ways of instantiating it, but one way is to instantiate it and then to attach a, a service account to that virtual machine that has specific permissions. And so what happens is when that machine needs to access something on the platform, it's going to uh, get a token issued on that service account that it can then present to a service somewhere in the, you know, in the Google Cloud ecosystem to validate that, yes, it has access to that particular service. Uh, and, and this is done through, again, the metadata service. And, and this is why the metadata service exists, because you don't want your application to have to do this step every single time. And so the idea is that it automatically will attach this, these tokens. It'll basically, uh, underneath, if you have a Python package doing this, underneath the Python package is going to go to the metadata service, get those access tokens. And then on those, those uh, REST API requests or the API requests going across, it will automatically attach it as a bearer token to get access to that, that service that's running on, on, on the platform. So that's basically why you would do something like this. You're basically getting the machines uh, bearer token so that you can pretend to be the machine everywhere on Google Cloud. And that might give you way more access than you initially had on that very first uh, uh, token. So that's what we're going to do next. So I do a Google G Cloud auth print access token and I'm like, oh, wow, there's a nice bearer token. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy that. And uh, you, you remember before I had that test permission script, I'm going to see what permissions this thing has access to. So I'll go back to the other window that's got my Cloud Shell. Uh, in it. And so if I do a Python and I do a scripts test permissions and I just give it this bearer token, um, it'll do exactly the same thing as it did with the, the JSON uh, file. It'll just brute force uh, all the permissions on the thing. And so you look, oh, there's a whole bunch. The only thing this thing has access to is the logging infrastructure. But you know what? Uh, if, it has, uh, if it has the permissions to list the logs and to read them, then maybe that's what I need to do uh, next. So um, uh, one of the things that you can do is, uh, so again, for the metadata stuff, you can actually get the access token by doing a curl onto the metadata service. So um, this, is the, this is the magic uh, metadata URI, or let me, let me copy and paste it. So if you wanted to get your own access token, so basically what this command does is it does this request locally. And uh, I think this metadata service is just running uh, in the hypervisor or something to do the, the token magic. Uh, and this is the way, this, is, this gets the token as well. So, and then of course, this is the way Google has shut down SSRF by forcing any of these requests for metadata to have a specific header that no proxy would ever include in their request. Uh, so that's what that is. Uh, and then you can see, oh yeah, I got the same access token here. Uh, and it gives me the expiration time, but it, it's basically the same as this uh, that we saw earlier. Uh, one of the things that it gives you an expiration time, uh, students have run across the fact that they got one version of the access token, but then they, they went to get dinner or you know, they got, got a cup of coffee and the thing expired and they're like, oh, the CTF broke. And then you'd be like, oh, well, you, you need to get a fresh token because this thing will refresh. Um, but that's something that you can, you can teach them about. Okay, so I know I have access to the log files after doing the, the test permissions on that thing. Uh, so then maybe I'll, I'll do a G Cloud logging list on this thing. And so I can run it right here because most of the VMs come with the G Cloud uh, 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 SDK in it, so I don't have to install it. And so you'll look here and these are the log uh, uh, file, the logs that are being collected on, on this, that, that are being collected on this particular project. And so you can see there's a log slash transactions uh, one. So then basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a G Cloud logging um, read, and then I'm gonna give it that, uh, that log file. And I'm gonna pipe this into less. Uh, and then you'll see all the log entries uh, in that log file. And it's pretty significant, but you see, and this was programmatically injected. When we did the create level, it's automatically populating the log files as part of what it's doing. And so uh, your, your, your goal is to get uh, Jason Clark's um, uh, credit card. 
And so you, this, this is what you would, in this case, screenshot and submit. That's basically how we have people prove that they have finished the level. Uh, and then you're done. Uh, so that is, uh, I think that's all I have to show. Um, are there are there any questions? Um, Because yeah, I think I don't have anything else I, uh, that I was planning on. So next week, uh, so there's two other things that we have uh, related to this. Uh, this this access to the log entries, like for a forensic, if you're doing cloud forensics, you want to see this this access right here from this VM. Uh, and so that's part of the defender. We're developing a defender path. Um, where we're testing it, really, it's been developed, but uh, where we teach students how to go into the log files and then look for this particular G Cloud logging read that comes from the VM on the command line uh, versus the web interface versus some other mechanism to, to get at the log files. And so that would be one of the things is to play the defender and say, hey, I got, I got, a, I got to do some post-mortem. Post um, so it's like all the SolarWinds folks right now got to figure out the post-mortem on all their cloud, cloud projects. Well, the idea would be to have these students go through part of the process of looking at the log files to determine uh, what exactly happened. Um, and so we're also, I have, we have a capstone team that's actually doing a, a cloud auditing CTF uh, where they would use Thunder CTF and they would populate it with a huge number of events that would then be ingested into a seam. Like on Google Cloud, it would be a data warehouse like BigQuery. And then they would do their analysis, their auditing analysis using BigQuery queries, like the SQL queries, rather than just doing this, which is like a linear search through log files. That never happens anymore because there's just too much data. So the idea is that when you get to terabytes worth of log data, you, you need to do something else. And that would be uh, one of the CTFs that we're developing as part of this. The other one that you'll, you'll see next week, if you show up for the OWASP uh, talk next week, is a least privileges one, where we get students to learn how to uh, reduce the privileges on something that's over provision. To see the thing that's over provision, to look at the code, to see the, what the code is actually needing, and then to reduce the privileges to exactly what the code really needs rather than project owner, which is basically what a lot of developers will do because they don't want to deal with security. They're like, give it everything <laughs> and then uh, catch it sometime else, like uh, undo it, undo it sometime else. And it never gets undone as it turns out. Well, not never, 4% of the time it gets undone apparently, but that's not my statistic. That's uh, someone else's statistic. Okay. Uh, so great. That's, that's a whole hour too. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I hope to see some of you in person one day. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, um, uh, the, my contact information is easy to find. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you everyone. And just so you know, we are going to post the recording of this and yeah, hopefully you can make next week. <laughs>